afternoon and good evening and welcome to this webinar on how to pre-think assumptions. My name is Rajesh Sidana. I'm one of the co-founders of EGMAD and I'm going to be your main host today. Uh, with me in this webinar is Komal Shah. Komal is, uh, is a GMAT strategy expert. She's also a former the GMAT moderator and, and, and she's going to be our co-host today. In this webinar, we're going to talk about a skill called pre-thinking. Pre-thinking is thinking an assumption in your mind before you look at the answer, your answer choices. And it's a, one of the most essential skills um, if you want to hit that 90th percentile in GMAT critical reasoning. Um, it's, a, it's a skill which, which most people need to acquire. It, it's not something that you know you learn while, while uh, going through your, your uh, K-12 education or so. But it's, it's an essential skill that helps you get to that 90th percentile. And to make sure that you, you're able to build that skill, we did send three video lessons your way. The three video lessons were one was uh, introduction to assumption. Um, and this one just lays that foundation of assumption. The second was uh, just an introduction to pre-thinking and in the, in the simplest form of arguments. And then uh, it's another uh, a specialist kind of argument. Uh, which which was uh, related to pre-thinking, which is called pre-thinking to, uh, to entities. This, the purpose of these three videos was to make sure that, or is to make sure that that you kind of prime to learn these this method on 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 uh, more difficult questions or or higher order questions as we call them. And um, and, and so if you've not gone through them, they are a part of your free trial. Post this session, uh, you know you should just log into your free trial and and go through them. With that, let me hide this. Uh, we also have some upcoming free webinars. We have one free webinar on, on GMAT algebra, and, and in this webinar, we're going to focus primarily on, on two topics, which is inequalities and absolute value questions. If these are if these topics bother you, uh, you're still not at that 90th percentile in, on, on GMAT algebra, and this is a webinar that you should attend. That's tomorrow, uh, 7 m Pacific time again, so 24 hours from now. And then for those of you who are aiming to, to get to a score of 700 or higher, we have this free GMAT strategy webinar, uh, which is next Saturday. Uh, in this, we're going to really talk about how should you build your study plan, which is personalized to your strengths and weaknesses. How should you build tracking metrics along those study plans? And while executing that study plan, how can you track whether you're actually um, on that improvement path? Okay, with that, let me uh, kind of understand the makeup of this group over here. Uh, the two questions that, that we usually ask to uh, to understand the makeup of this group. One is, when do you plan to take the test? The second is, hey, what's your target GMAT score? So based on the data as to when people want to take the test, um, I have almost 43% of you have not have just started preparing, presumably because you haven't taken a date as of yet. Um, and, and, and then, um, you know, at the four similarly sized groups, the, the largest group and the other four is about 20%, the smallest is about 10%. So it's not, I mean, it's, uh, it's a hundred percent swing. It's, it's it's big, but it's not huge, huge in my terms based on what I've seen, and and, and this is pretty typical for this time of the year when when uh, you're talking about either R3 for uh, for 2019 or or R1 for for uh, 2020. And with regards to the target GMAT scores, uh, the biggest chunk, uh, the biggest segment again is in that 730 to 750 bracket, which I think is a good place to be in, given the median scores at top business schools. And then we have uh, you know. Uh, a reasonable number of people in, in the adjoining groups uh, as well. And then we have a few folks, but 11, 12 odd percent of people in the 600 to 700 bracket as well. That's wonderful. Okay, with that, let's go right in the webinar pane. And in and, and the presentation, uh, our, 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 the screen will have changed for you. What you should be seeing over here is pre thinking for assumptions, CR1. Um, and, and let me actually put in a poll question so that uh, uh, if you see CR1 pre-thinking for assumption, if the presentation is visible to you, select yes. Um, if it's still loading, then, then you know, don't select anything. Um, if there's nothing over there, there's no indication that it's not loading, then select no. That's good. It's, it's pretty much has, has uh, loaded for everyone. For those of you who selected no, I would just recommend you join again. And, and usually when you join again, the problem does sort out by itself. That is great. With that, let's go right into the core of this webinar. And just to make sure we still have the video. 
I'm going to start sharing once again. Hopefully, the audio doesn't go bad. All right. So, the agenda for this presentation. We're going to first talk about how do you approach CR questions today. Then we're going to do what we call as a pre-thinking exercise. This is where we, we kind of lay the foundation of what an assumption is and, and essentially how do you go about doing pre-thinking. We kind of look at the process over here. Um, <coughs> Then we solve two full length questions, official questions. Actually, we solve three full length questions in this session now. And, and, and these questions are solved as a quiz, which means you get them one after the other. These are difficult questions. I, I want to re-emphasize 700 level questions. Again, the goal over here is to show how um, for such difficult questions, pre-thinking works flawlessly, how it makes uh, thinking through the argument fairly simple. Um, uh, and we're going to do a detailed review of, of pre-thinking. We're going to apply negation wherever we feel it's necessary. And, and then we're going to really talk about how can you be a skilled pre-thinker because uh, this this session is like a catalyst which, or an accelerant. But but beyond that, you still have to work to become a skilled pre-thinker. Where can you really get more learning content? Where can you get more practice? So essentially, at a very high level, we're going to document how you prepare today. Then we're going to look at uh, what's important to master CR assumptions. And then we should really look at how should you go about uh, doing the next step so that you get the most out of this webinar. Let me straighten, straighten this chord over here. Okay, so before we do that, let's kind of understand what pre-thinking is. Pre-thinking is, is this, thinking of one potential assumption in your mind in 15 seconds before uh, looking at the answer choices. Uh, now, the three words and quotes are really, really important. Um, you know. Uh, an, an argument can have multiple assumptions. So, so while we're doing pre-thinking, we're not looking at all the possible realm of assumptions that an argument can have. We are only looking at one potential assumption. Second, if you are, when you are a skilled pre-thinker, uh, not if, when you are a skilled pre-thinker, you'd be able to do this in about 15 seconds. And, and, and the third thing, probably the most important thing, is you've got to do this before you start looking at the answer choices. And I say it's most important because um, uh, you know, it may seem it's fairly simple, but it's easier said than done. Why? Because by default, you are wired to look at the answer choices for clues, and and and, and to to change that behavior is the first step towards uh, towards doing pre thinking. Okay, um, so so that's something which is really important over there. I want to make sure that that we emphasize that point uh, again and again. Okay, and, and the reason why I want to make sure uh, is that because we were, this pre-thinking as a term has existed for over 15 years in, in, in the GMAT preparation world, but no one defined pre-thinking. Pre-thinking, if you go and read blogs out there, if you read what other experts say, they kind of make it synonymous with predicting the answer. That is not what we are trying to do over here. We are not looking to predict the answer, and the, which is why we, we were the first company that defined this term precisely. And, and every solution or every question that you see on the EGMAT platform, whether it's in the learning phase or in the practice phase, imbibes this approach. Um, Pre-thinking is simply about understanding the logic that the author is using. We are not trying to, to, to predict what the answer would be in the answer choices. Okay. With that, let's kind of look at how do you approach uh, critical reasoning questions today and uh, I'm going to put in a poll question um, over here. There are two methodologies that people use. One is they read the argument, they look at the answer choices and they do back and forth between the argument and answer choices till they reach the final candidate. The second is they read the argument, they pre-think the assumption and then they evaluate the answer choices. So which methodology do you use? And um, let me start the video once again. Um, The question is, which methodology do you use? And, and once I get I about 125 students in the webinar now, once I get about uh, 75 to 80 responses, I will uh, broadcast the results. I have about 63 responses as of now, 69, 70. Let's get 10 more responses, 75, 76, 77, and 79, and one more. Good, great. It's very interesting how, how this kind of always goes down to, to like a more or less a 50-50 split. So, um, uh, um, so yeah. So I'm going to turn the video off because if you, if you are facing issues and, and at critical points, I'm going to turn it on once again. 
So then the next piece which is there is that uh, that if you are someone who, who actually uses the pre-thinking approach, so if you use methodology two, then where do you spend the biggest chunk of your time? So let me actually put in the poll question over here as well. And, 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 and the question says most, think of it as biggest chunk, not most. And there are three options here, reading and understanding the argument, pre-thinking and uh, and essentially evaluating answers. And this is only for folks who use the pre-thinking approach. If you don't use the pre-thinking approach, then that's the question isn't relevant to you. All right, uh, you'd hear me drink water from time to time. Uh, let me end the poll, broadcast the results. And then the data actually shows is very telling over here. So about 64% of you, 63% of you, give or take, spend a good chunk of your time in reading and understanding the argument, which is where you should be spending this time. Uh, if you're following the pre-thinking approach, you're going to spend a ton of time on, on, on the original argument. And, and because you're spending more time on the original argument, typically people would spend between uh, 45 seconds to about a minute 10 on reading the original argument. Uh, the time spent on selecting the answer choices is going to be very, very little. Uh, now, if you are someone who's spending a ton of time on selecting the correct answer, then you're not doing pre-thinking properly. That's a, that's a classical indicator, um, probably the most common indicator that your pre-thinking part is, is not being done properly, which is why you're being confused, which is why you're spending time choosing between answer choices. Okay, now with that, uh, before we go on to pre-thinking, we want to make sure that each one of you understands what an assumption is. And, and, and to do this, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a very simple argument, an argument that uh, <coughs> probably each one of you is intimately familiar with. Why? Because you, if you're going to do your MBA, you probably are think about this argument day in and day night. What I want to do is I want you to read that argument and I want you to, to enter what do you think the author assumes over there. So, so read the argument and tell. I'm not using broadcast results over here. So, when you if you type in the answer, press enter. You probably think that you've not put the answer in, but trust me, uh, the answer does come through, and you're going to see it once I click. Once I And what you have to type in is the assumption that the author makes. All right, I have 45 answers. Let me broadcast the results. Um, okay, so so I've got so pretty much 58 answers. That's excellent. Thank you for that participation. But but this is really good. I mean, um, I want to make two points over here. One or other. I want to first make an observation. Then I want to make two points. The observation is most of you, and then I say most, upwards of 80% of you got this right in in terms of you you understood the logic of the argument. Okay, that's that's an observation. You look at the answers, scroll through them. Uh, you, you you're gonna kind of find a very similar theme, which is hey, if you want to get into Ivy League, you need a, you need to score higher than 500. Um, now, that's that's kind of the observation. The the the, the, the two inferences that I want to make out of this is the first one is um, you know you're able to do this in, in in another observation. You're able to do this in about 30 seconds. Why? Because you were intimately familiar with this argument. So, if, so the inference is, if you understand the argument well, doing pre-thinking comes naturally to most of us. And 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 so one of the key things that you need to be able to do pre-thinking is to be able to to understand that argument. Why? Because you do this pre-thinking is, is a very natural thing. As humans, we are what I call as 
natu- we question naturally we are what i also say many of us are naturally destructive which means we try and destroy the author's reasoning and 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 and, and when we try and destroy the author's reasoning which is that's when we stumble upon assumptions and i'm going to talk a lot more about that the second observation or the second inference that i'm going to really talk about is, is in about 10 seconds but let's kind of look at what's happening over here you know the author gives you a data point which says joe scored 500 on 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 the gmat and then based on that data point he makes a claim he says he makes a prediction to be more specific that he will not get admission in an ivy league college this is a prediction about the future now Uh, and while making that prediction he kind of makes a jump from from that score of 500 to to the admission over here so while making that jump the author um, uh, uh, really what he assumes is a score of 500 is unacceptable to ivy league colleges but there's one thing which is really really important over here which is this part for someone like joe why because because in the conclusion the author says he will not get admission into an ivy league college the author is not saying that the prince of saudi arabia will not get admission in in an ivy league college um, or so on and so forth so so it's it's really important even though you understood the logic it's really important to focus on certain details more specifically in the conclusion to know what the conclusion is talking about because the assumption will typically be intimately linked to those details uh so another take away that i want to have over here but you know good job in understanding the logic that the author was trying to make so with that if you were to really kind of think about that and then really say hey what is an assumption what's what's the what's the formal definition of an assumption what would that be <coughs> again i'm going to give you about a minute to write that down what is the formal definition of an assumption okay i have three answers let's let's start to get let's get to about 20 answers for this one what's the formal definition of an assumption ten answers 13 answers 18 answers 23 good let me start broadcasting results um unstated reasoning something that must be true uh unstated premises that support um okay unstated information information which is not given information that completes the logic okay so so good good answers uh, some of them are great answers others are are answers that show um uh, i would say a roundabout understanding not a super precise understanding so and and this is at this point you know i want you to I'd, I'd like you to write down very few points in this session why because i'm going to share the pdf but it, out of the three things that i wanted to write down while you are in this session is one of them is this definition which is an assumption is an unstated idea that must be true for the conclusion to be valid okay uh, write this down i'm going to give you about a minute the reason i want you to write this down is because as you do the 700 level questions you're going to see answer choices that will confuse the hell out of you and at that point i'm going to ask you to reiterate the definition the moment you reiterate the definition uh, you'd be able to really mark the answer correct or incorrect with 100% certainty okay that's this definition is the only thing that you need to know um and and, and it, this is i mean in in some ways there's a certain beauty to this this is like newton's laws or rather the second law of newton for those of you who are kind of familiar with the science background if you know that law you can pretty much build anything in mechanics uh, over there as long as you know the material properties but 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 this is which is kind of this definition is kind of similar if you know this definition you can pretty much answer any assumption question it's it's that precise it's that pure um, as long as you know how to read and comprehend information that's all that you need to know okay so write this down so what does this mean let's kind of takes in for some information out of it because an, an assumption is an unstated idea which means that the information that is there in the assumption uh, it should not be inferred from the factual part of the argument uh, in other words an assumption is actually the, uh, the complete opposite uh, or or mutually exclusive to what an inference is why because it is an unstated idea uh, which means it cannot be inferred from from the factual part of the argument 
The second piece, which 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 an assumption satisfies is this what we call as that must be true condition, which means that if this assumption were not true, the conclusion would be invalidated or the conclusion would break down. They're essentially the same things overall. And 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 if you think if you're evaluating in a statement and if you're trying to figure out whether that statement is a correct assumption, you're gonna find out that 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 if it's a correct assumption, it'll satisfy both these conditions. A it will provide information that you can't infer from the from the factual part of the argument and b it will satisfy that must be true condition and we're going to look at what is that must be true condition in a lot of detail okay so just if i were to uh, essentially kind of explain this in a in a more uh, pictorial format think of this entire argument to be this house which is supported by these three pillars now your conclusion is is the roof over here uh, the conclusion is this roof and and remember these three pillars are supporting the conclusion which is where premises in 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 the argument uh, 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 support your conclusion okay or, or okay now now each of these three pillars are making the conclusion stronger but one of these pillars is an essential pillar and that pillar is is what we call as an assumption now, some of you may say, hey, but the conclusion, but, but the assumption is not stated. Yeah, that's true. But if you were to really think about what does must be true mean, this is the way to think about it, which is that, hey, it is that pillar without which the conclusion would break down. Now, there will be statements that you, which you may find tempting. And then you may say, man, they are like assumptions too. They, those statements are, are like these supporting pillars. They make the conclusion stronger, but they are not must be true. Um, okay. So the assumption is that essential statement and, 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 and just keep this picture in mind as we move forward for the next eight minutes and then it'll become very, very clear as I take a couple of examples. Okay, let me just move this out so that we, we have more real estate to focus on. So what does must be true mean? Just to, uh, to, to reiterate, it means that if the information provided by assumption is not true, then the conclusion uh, can no longer hold true or if you were to simply state this the assumption must be true for the conclusion to remain valid So then the question is hey, what does validity of the conclusion mean? I mean some of you may be asking what does that mean that for the conclusion to remain valid and and You know if you if you think this is too basic just stay with me for for five minutes because you're going to really see the application of it on, on more complex arguments so same argument that we use Joe's code 500 on the GMA, therefore he'll not get admission in Ivy League college. So under what condition is, is this conclusion falsified? Let me put in the short answer poll question. What, what situation leads to falsification of this conclusion? Can you guys type that out? When would the conclusion be falsified? When Joe gets scores 500 and gets an admit, yet, yes, that's absolutely correct. Okay, so falsification of conclusion means when Joe gets admission with a score of 500. Okay, that's when the conclusion is destroyed. Okay, now let's figure out how will we evaluate whether you know a certain answer choice is the correct assumption. Okay, same argument. This is what we said is the correct assumption. Let's kind of use that test to formally. Um, falsification means destroying okay um, so let's formally look at and say whether this is the correct assumption okay we, the question that we're going to ask is uh, that is it must be true why why Because you already know this provides new information. Why? Because this unacceptability piece is not something that, that is inferred from the factual part of the argument, which is this part of the argument. So the question that we have to ask is, is that must be true? Which means without this piece of information being true, will the conclusion break down? So the question that you're asking formally is, will Joe get admission in an Ivy League college with a score of 500? If the statement to the left, which means this particular statement over here, if this statement no longer holds true. Now, listen to this very carefully. 
if the statement if a statement no longer holds true then by definition its negated version becomes true and i'm going to explain this if you say that this statement no longer holds true what you're really saying is that its negated version holds true which means what is its negated version that a statement a score of 500 for someone like joe is acceptable to ivy league colleges now if this statement holds true then what happens to my conclusion does my conclusion break down which means does joe get, get admission uh, when a score of 500 becomes acceptable absolutely i mean if if score of 500 for someone like like joe is acceptable if this part is true then the author cannot say with 100% certainty that that joe will not get admission into ivy league college and it breaks the conclusion down now many of you may be thinking that hey how can you really say that when a statement is not true its negated version automatically becomes true how many of you are thinking that how can you say when a statement is not true its negated version automatically becomes true you can say, let's say type in yes uh, i know many of you are raising hands okay perfect okay so let's kind of look at this and i'm going to give you some examples so to really prove my point simple examples um, if you say harvard has the best mba program okay if you say let's look at this statement harvard has the best mba program if you say that statement isn't true then by definition what you're really saying is that hey harvard does not have the best mba program or an mba program which is better than harvard or as good as harvard exists is that true if you say that's if you say this statement isn't true then by definition you are also saying that right so its negative version automatically is becoming true let's take another some example very very simple example john runs faster than david okay if you say that statement isn't true then what are you saying by definition what else are you saying You can say either David runs faster than John or David is as fast as John. Okay. Don't go towards slower just because, you know, it's just forming that the logic is, is correct, but forming that logic becomes a bit more complex. But, but uh, go towards David is as fast or faster. Why? Because you see the word faster over here. Okay. So, um, so by definition when you say this statement is not true what you're also saying is that david is as fast as john or david runs faster than john and ajay has a really good question he's saying hey it seems we are able to and i think ajay i'm kind of uh, adding to your question but essentially what you're asking is it just seems like you're able to get to the assumption without doing falsification is falsification really necessary it's a great question it's a question that a lot of people ask and for simple arguments as as i said earlier we are natural we as humans um, especially most of us are logical we question things very naturally and and for simple arguments what you're going to find is falsification is not as necessary but again if you want to get to that 90th percentile you won't be dealing with simple arguments the the, the simplest argument that you'd be dealing with is something which is of going to be of medium difficulty most likely and 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 there as i'm going to demonstrate as we go towards the more challenging questions pre-thinking gives a certain uh, gives that precision which which you would otherwise find a uh, struggle to to achieve okay but really good question ajay thank you for asking that question and it's really important to ask this question frankly speaking that hey i'm going to do this effort i'm going to learn this new thing what benefit does it provide to me Okay, let me actually just clear the Q&A part. Okay, so that's must be true, which means if an answer choice, uh, um, is, 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 is must be true or the correct assumption, then the conclusion will break down in the presence of its negated version. That's kind of uh, uh, built on the very definition uh, that, an, that an assumption is an unstated idea that must be true for the conclusion to be valid. 
if you think about it it's based on 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 that must be true definition over here so this isn't rocket science but the application of it the precision of it requires very diligent effort now there's another part to this as well if the answer choice is not must be true which means it's the incorrect answer choice then what you're going to find is that the conclusion will not break down in the presence of negated instance of that answer choice okay so which is <coughs> kind of where um, uh, this method really helps so let's kind of take the same example okay and let's take let's evaluate this part over here because one of you actually said this a score of 500 is not a good score now let's see whether this statement is an assumption let's evaluate that and, and the question again we are asking is is this must be true or in other words the same question will Joe get admission if the statement to the left which is let me get my annotation right uh, no longer holds true so if this is no longer holds true it's negated instance holds true by definition which means the score of 500 becomes on the GMAT becomes a good score uh, which which also means that hey does Joe get admission if the score of 500 is deemed to be a good score the answer is not really why because this conclusion over here when you think about it is not predicated on on whether that score of 500 is considered to be you know good or bad it's just the author is just saying Joe scored 500 it's a numerical value and and therefore he will not get admission in an Ivy League college there's no a predication of whether what that score is considered to be okay Bhagavad has a great question he says hey if, is this falsification technique the same as pre-thinking no uh, pre-thinking is coming up with an assumption a falsification technique is is, is a technique which is used to do pre-thinking so it's an essential part of it and I'm going to explain that uh, but but good Bhagavad I'm really really happy that you're thinking in that direction okay so essentially and this is the other piece that I wanted to write down that must be true helps you narrow down for the correct answer choice uh, the conclusion does not hold true when you negate that answer choice or conclusion breaks down in the presence of uh, the negated version of correct answer choice and for the incorrect answer choice the conclusion still holds true in the presence of that negated version that's basically your, your, your must be true uh, narrowing down this is all the foundation that we needed we're done with that now we're going to start having fun so what are we going to do i'm going to give you an argument and i'm going to give you three minutes to do your pre-thinking so ample amount of time to do your pre-thinking uh, even though i say two minutes i'm going to give you three minutes over here i don't want you to rush through things then um, after we look at your answers in the short answer poll what we're going to do is you're going to figure out how we go about doing pre-thinking i'm going to again uh, uh, kind of bu build on what all we have learned together uh, so far and and then we're going to look at a couple of submissions if possible but but the nice thing that I've seen over here is once we get through the once we get to the method of pre-thinking what starts to happen is you guys start to tell me what the assumptions are going to be why because that's how easy getting to assumptions becomes okay now what are the what are certain skills that you should know one is you should be able to figure out how to read an argument figure out what the main conclusion is the second is 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 again you've got to uh, understand what the uh, what 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 the conclusion is saying and then you need to by looking at the facts in the argument and by looking at the conclusion you should be able to understand the author's logic we already know what an assumption is that's good now some of you will do really well others would falter and why would you falter you're used to reading fast you're used to kind of rushing through and you're used to really saying hey what is the answer on the GMAT success comes when you follow the process if you question if you kind of say what is the answer then you're really your mind goes into a search mode and and that's when it goes blank you don't want to do that rather you want to focus on reading the argument slowly you want to focus on following you're going to say what am i going to do in the next step to get it get to the answer what am i going to do in the step after that so the more methodical you are the easier it is to ace the gmat the more you look at the clock the more difficult it's going to be for you okay so in a nutshell if you have the right approach which is built on a solid foundation 
async gmat cr is fairly easy why because we use pre thinking not just in, in assumptions we use it in in evaluate we use it in strength and weaken uh, questions as well and then we use a modified form of it in in bold face questions as well so this kind of lays that foundation of everything okay with that Okay, guys, another. All right, five, four, three, two, and one. <coughs> so let's, I'm going to give you about a minute to read through this since I think you're intimately familiar with the topic that we're talking about. You should be able to, uh, to figure out uh, what, what you guys are saying. Now, there's a certain theme that you're going to really see in this. A couple of really, really good answers, and when we get to you know the set of correct answers, it will be very clear which ones are good. Um, the couple of answers where where you're saying uh, you're you're uh, which which I'd say you kind of I think you understand the uh, the logic, but but the precision is lacking over there. Where you know some of you are saying all professors get rewards and all of that stuff over there. Um, uh, some of you are really talking about. The amount of focus that tenure professors do, and we're going to really look at why 
that is not as as great if you're talking about the total compensation piece and so on and so forth so 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 let's kind of look at and see how when we do pre-thinking it, it allows us to focus on the core problem that we are trying to solve which is the logic that the author is using so the, the first piece which we have to do in, in, in this is we've got to figure out which statement is our main conclusion. Now this answer, this poll has four options. This argument only has three statements. So um, so so only choose uh, statement one, two, or three once I show the three statements to you. So hold on to that. But, but the approach that we're going to use is we're going to first isolate the conclusion. We're going to understand the conclusion. Then we're going to look at the logic that the author is using. And then we're going to ask a pre-thinking question and what is that pre-thinking question that we're going to ask let's kind of see what that question is the pre-thinking question or comes right from from the very definition of what an assumption is what is an assumption an assumption is an unstated idea that must be true for the conclusion to be valid or in other words an assumption is required for the conclusion to be valid which means that without the assumption, the conclusion will break down. So as I mentioned earlier, that assumption is that essential pillar that keeps that conclusion, which was the roof of the house, upright. So where would you put that essential pillar if you were to really build a house and if you want to keep the roof upright? Uh, you'd build, put the essential pillar where the roof is likely to break. So, so if you follow the same logic, an assumption is built around the scenarios in which which the conclusion breaks down. So if you figure out the scenarios that lead to the conclusion breaking down, you can really say, hey, I'm going to put an assumption there and I'm going to say such scenario is not possible. That's what the role of an assumption is, by the way. It must be true for the conclusion to be valid. So given all the information, uh, let's figure out under what scenarios does the conclusion break down and an assumption simply is that, that those scenarios do not exist. So let's kind of figure out on focusing the scenarios uh, that under which the conclusion breaks down. So the question that we're going to ask is, under what circumstances, given the facts and the argument, will the conclusion break down? Okay. Here is our argument. Here are the three statements. So this argument, again, the same argument is divided into three statements. I want you to tell me which statement is the main conclusion of this argument. Let's get a few more responses. Which statement is the main conclusion in this argument? I have 50 responses. Let's get to about 80 responses. That way I'll have a good coverage over about 130 odd people in the session. <coughs> 78, 81, good. 3, 2, and 1. Let me end the poll. Now, before I share the results, one of the reasons why I, I, we do this is we ask so many poll questions, and this is something you're going to find very unique to EGMAT webinars, is because when you ask these poll questions, you understand how the group as a whole is thinking, and, 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 and you can then modulate the session accordingly. Let's broadcast the results. What you see is half the people have chosen statement 2, which is my, my conclusion. This part is my conclusion. 32% uh, of you think statement one is my conclusion. And, and, and the reason why you've chosen, because we've conducted this session many a times, is because you see this word concludes. And you say, man, there's a word conclude over here. This has to be my main conclusion. And, and you get this wrong over here. Um, a conclusion, if you've chosen statement one as a conclusion, one thing that you've got to remember is that a conclusion is always by the author. In this case, in statement one, this conclusion is a conclusion that the that's written in a paper. So some published paper states this thing, okay, or concludes this thing. But as a whole, statement one is a is a fact. Okay. Statement two is my conclusion. Why? Because this is what the author wants you to believe. So what is this conclusion saying? It's saying the difference between professors in the tenure system and other full-time lecturers has to do with the reward system for the former. So it's really important you understand this. What the author is saying is, he's saying, I agree that that uh, that that professors uh, uh, 
actually uh, or full time lecturers enhance student learning more than uh, than than professors on their way to tenure do okay so i agree with the findings of the paper but while making his conclusion what the author is saying is that that delta that difference is caused by the reward system for the former who is the former former is professors over here okay because you're talking about former and latter former is professors the latter is full time lecturers and then statement number 3 is written to support statement number 2 which is that the criterion for rewarding tenured faculty which is professors typically places greater emphasis on research than on teaching okay so i want to ask another poll question over here what whose reward system does statement 3 talk about this statement this is statement number 3 over here whose reward system does it talk about does it talk about the reward system solely for tenured faculty does it talk about the reward system for lecturers or does it talk about the reward system for both tenured faculty and lecturers whose reward system does this talk about does it talk about tenured faculty does it talk about lecturers does it talk, talk about both 3 2 and 1 77 let's get to 80 we have the sweet spot at 80 77 responses let's get to 80 responses 78 79 and 83 good let me end the poll broadcast the results 75% of you say it's it's tenured faculty and you are correct it only talks about the reward system for tenured faculty and and this is kind of where a reading skill is required the criterion for rewarding tenured faculty typically places greater greater as a comparative word emphasis on research than on teaching so what it's really saying is for tenured faculty the reward system places greater emphasis on research than on teaching or in other words if we were to put some numbers typically when i see comparative words it's good to put numbers maybe it puts 70% emphasis on on research and and 30% emphasis on 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 teaching and and that's kind of for me i look at greater so that's all it's saying it's not saying anything about the reward system for lecturers or anything nalantha says does the word clearly indicate that this was the conclusion nalan so a uh, good point nalantha nalantha nilantha sorry uh, clearly is what we call as a conclusion marker it is a conclusion marker now what you're going to find and this is going to be true in in bolfe's question especially that a certain a single argument will have multiple conclusions i mean that's why we call a conclusion as an intermediate conclusion as well as a main conclusion and in that case you may see two or three conclusion markers within the same argument so it's it's really important to understand the definition of the main conclusion and not rely just on conclusion markers conclusion markers can be a guide definitely but when it comes to defining what that main conclusion is going to be uh, you know uh, uh uh we 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 uh, that's where understanding the logic of the argument becomes supremely important uh sorab says don't full time lecturers get reward uh, i think they do but we don't know anything about it sorab and which is kind of the interesting thing about this argument okay so again to reiterate this part is the main conclusion this is a supporting statement okay it's a it's a data point and then this is context context which is or 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 another which is another fact on which the the entire argument is based okay so <coughs> let's kind of look at the pre thinking question the pre thinking question again the general structure of the question doesn't change it says under what circumstances given the facts and the argument will the conclusion break down let's translate this question under what circumstances would the reward system not be responsible for the difference in performance given that full time lecture we know that full time lecturers enhance student performance more than professors do okay and the the second thing that we know is the reward system for professors places greater emphasis on 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 research than on teaching 
we know these two things over there. Read the falsification question. Read the framework for this. Okay. And, and then tell me, based on this framework, are you able to understand how we formed this falsification question? Okay. Based on the framework, can you really see how we formed this falsification question? The question is, under what circumstances would the reward system not be responsible? So what the author is saying, what, what we want to really say is, is there a scenario in which I cannot blame the reward system uh, 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 for the difference in performance given this piece of information? Okay. And some of you are now starting to give me good answers. Okay. So, again, under what circumstances would, we not, would the reward system not cause the difference? Okay, what are some possible scenarios? One is, and 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 let's and read this uh, very very clearly, is if non-tenured faculty has the same reward system, which means their reward system is identical, then you can't blame tenured faculty. Uh, I want you to read this because if if this is true, if non-tenured faculty has the same reward system as tenured faculty then you can't say that the reward system is responsible. Okay. And the reason why I want to emphasize on this part is because many of you are saying, hey, what if something else is responsible? And yes, when you identify an argument as a causal argument, in this case, this is a causal argument, that something else formula that you have is a very easy thing to apply, but that's now how, not how the answer choices would be worded. You know, and you would not say something else is responsible for, for, for what's happening in the conclusion. Typically, the answer would uh, would would really be something like this hey if non if non tenured faculty has similar emphasis on research then would the conclusion break down or will, is that a falsifying scenario right the conclusion will break down then you can't blame the reward system the second thing as one of you really said is that if most tenure professors do not act as per the reward system. I mean, you may build a reward system, but hey, if professors don't care about it, if majority of the professors don't care about it, then then essentially they don't act as per the reward system. Now, if everyone's getting paid equal, equally, Bhavika, that is not the same thing as that of an identical reward system. Why? Because I may pay you as a professor $100,000 in the reward system, but with a much higher emphasis on research and, and much lower emphasis on teaching, I may pay a full-time lecturer $100,000 as well, but with a much higher emphasis on teaching than on research. In that case, you're paying it equally, but you have different reward systems. Okay. So, what are my assumptions? Non-tenured faculties, uh, fac uh, professors do not have an identical reward system. Okay, and 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 tenured professors care about the reward system. These are my assumptions. Where do these assumptions come from? Each one of them comes from one of the possible falsifying scenarios. <coughs> okay. So. These are this, and, 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 and there's another third one which uh, Lucas really says that, hey, uh, if focus on teaching or focus on research has no effect on, 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 on someone's ability to teach, then also you can't blame the reward system. Good, Lucas. That's a good one. Okay. So, but, but the first thing that I want you to really see is when you ask this falsification question, once you frame the falsification question, you know, can you really see that getting to assumption becomes fairly simple. Once you frame that falsification question, figuring out assumption becomes very, very trivial. Why you guys are doing that right now? Okay, and we're going to really see more and more of this. You're going to solve three to four more arguments, complex arguments, but with answer choices. And then there, you're going to see even more value for this method. Why? Because there you're going to see confusing answer choices. And once you ask the pre-thinking question, what you're going to find is getting to the correct answer starts to become very, very easy. Okay. Uh, 
uh, Thirta says the first falsification is about emphasis on research, whereas the assumption is 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 jumps to reward. Why? Uh, Thirta, the the reward is built up of uh, two things, right? Uh, research and teaching. That's what we are known. So so essentially, if I'm telling you about about research, I'm implicitly telling you about teaching as well. Okay, and, 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 and that's something which when you go through our inference module, we tell you how do you infer information from statements and this is kind of a, a, one of the foundational skills over there. Okay. Ajay says there can be other scenarios which we may have missed and the author may have assumed, right? Uh, so Ajay, the good thing about this is that in in the two or three things. So, so one is, and this is a really good question. A lot of people have this. Um, one is once you come up with one assumption, which is where the definition of pre-thinking was coming up with one assumption, you truly understand the logic that the author is using. And and once you understand the logic that the author is using, even if you see an assumption you've not thought about, the moment you see it in answer choices, you're able to evaluate it successfully. This is the same thing that, that happened when Lewis and actually mentioned one of the other falsification scenarios that I had not thought about, and good job, Lewis, on that. And, and, and I was able to instantly evaluate, despite giving this lecture, that, hey, that was a good falsification scenario. Okay, So, so one thing is that that's what happens. The second thing is uh, good CR arguments are, are airtight enough that you can probably come up with three falsification scenarios and not more. Okay, and uh, Kostub says, is falsification scenario thought before pre-thinking the assumption? Yes, the answer to falsification question gives you uh, uh, gives you essentially your assumptions. So I'm going to quickly go through this, but let's talk about pre-thinking and timing. And how many of you are concerned about timing with regards to pre-thinking over here? How many of you are concerned about timing? A lot of you are good you're a bit worried about timing that's good it's good to be worried it's good to actually put in your concerns over here and here is how your pre-thinking journey will go about okay but but before this I want to ask this question what do you know about EG Matt with regards to the success of our students especially on the verbal side of things what do you know about EGMAT? Nothing, okay. What else? Someone says nothing. Okay. SC is the best, okay. It boots, helps boost GMAT scores. So, here's something that I want you to do when it, when it comes to uh, knowing about success. Go to GMAT to go to two places on GMAT Club. Actually, three places if you have a good LinkedIn profile, which means a connected LinkedIn profile. First place, go to GMAT Club Share GMAT Experience. And the nice thing about there is you can actually click on company tags and you can see how many success stories are there for each company. When you do that, what you're gonna find is if you click on eGMAT, you're gonna find more than 10 pages of success story. When you click on another company's account, you're going to find that no company has more than five pages. You're going to find a very similar story with regards to reviews, where 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 you're going to find that uh, that 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 uh, uh, you know we have more reviews than anyone else in the industry, and and in more reviews which are backed by score reports. The third thing that you're going to find if you are active on LinkedIn is that if you go and contact the current students, uh, especially international students. Uh, uh, at, at top business schools, you're going to find the biggest chunk of those students are, are, are XG matters. Okay. Samuel says, is GMAT Club and EGMAT the same company? No, we are actually very different entities. GMAT Club is, is actually uh, run by BB, who lives out of Washington, D.C. It has 10, actually it has 12 partners, and EGMAT is one of the partners over there. 
Okay. And the reason why I'm saying that is, is, you know, the reason why, one of the key reasons why the success is the way it is, is because our methods are very unique and they are applicable universally. They'll, they'll work on every assumption question that you're going to really see. And you can extend this to every evaluate, every strengthen and every weaken question. Okay. <coughs> It is says, is EGMAT helpful for non-international students? Yes, a lot of non-international students actually go through it. And, and uh, so, so last year we had about uh, 2,000. We call them essentially, we, we define, in, we call it international, but the more precise definition is what we call as natives and non-natives. And, and we define someone as a native if you've done your K3 to K12 in, in one of five countries, which is um, in the USA, UK, Canada, Australia, or New Zealand. Okay, if, so if you've done it in one of these K third grade to twelfth grade in one of these countries, we call you a native, and and everyone else is a non-native. So so the non-native part is the international piece overall. Okay, and if you want to really see our new success stories, just go to our YouTube channel. We actually upload two success stories, two raw video interviews every week. So, so you can see a lot of that over there as well. So, uh, or go to GMAT Club and click on the, the eGMAT tag. You're going to see a very similar story. So how will you feel as you do this? Because I agree that you should be worried about timing. Why? Because it seems to be a long process. It's not the shortcuts that everyone tells you. Okay. So when you start doing pre-thinking, let's say you are at this point number one over here which is your time to answer questions is, 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 is slightly more than medium. And then again, I've put it in relative terms. Why? Because I have 130 students here and then uh, for everyone, the time to answer questions is going to be different. So let's say you are <coughs> at that medium point. And, 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 and once you start doing pre-thinking, two things will happen. One is your accuracy will go up, but your time to answer questions will also go up as you can really see the you're moving in this direction and you're going to ask yourself you're going to say hey why am i doing this i'm already worried about timing on that verbal section and then this method seems to make me take longer surprisingly people don't appreciate the improvement in accuracy but they get worried more about timing and, and i i kind of understand where you're coming from but at that point continue to have faith and once you have faith you're going to see two things happen one is your accuracy will continue to improve the second is your time to answer questions will actually remove reduce drastically it will be better than 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 or lower than what it was before and then you're going to say now i understand why we follow pre-thinking why is it that so many people uh, uh you know what uh, talk about pre-thinking and um, then as you continue to do that, you're going to see this over and over. Okay. Um, and, and so, so ultimately, one to two, a lot of people do. Two to three is, is where you need about 10 arguments to do this. And if you do it truly diligently, you're going to start seeing uh, the fruit of pre-thinking. Okay, and, and this is something which which uh, is, is, is over here. It says, you read this deeply, which says, understand the passage completely. Take your time. Equally important, pre-think an answer before looking at an answer choice. Probably this one word will have the most impact on your GMAT score. Okay. Um, <coughs> the guy who scored 740 um, overall. As another guy... Uh, who scored a 770 this was i think late last year he says answer cr questions if, as if there are no answer choices this guy improved from a 700 to a 770 in about 18 days he says when you when it gets a 700 plus level questions you have to do pre-thinking the reason to do the to the pre-thinking is to help you focus on logic and not deviate from the key argument when trap or out of scope answer choices show up um, Again, this guy is a Canadian. Someone was talking about uh, native speakers. Um, and, and, and again, he improved from a V34. And when he had a V34, this guy had 35th percentile 
overall to a V42. And then when he had V42, he had 97th percentile NCR. Here's another one. Um, it says, this pre-thinking primes the mind and we are constantly on our toes while reading either an RC paragraph or a CR question stem. Apart from comprehending the passage, we keep speculating that in which direction the passage will orient or what logical jump has the author taken. This guy improved from a 520 to a 740. Now, let's kind of see where pre-thinking helps you get to that right answer. And to do this, we're going to solve this official question. I'm going to give you again three minutes. It's a fairly simple argument, but confusing answer choices. So do do pre-thinking. And as you do pre-thinking, you're going to find getting to the right answer becomes fairly easy. Myself. All right, we have 15 more seconds. Let's get those answers in.
थ्री टू एंड वन लेट मी एम द पोल एंड ब्रॉडकास्ट रिजॉल्व सो दर इज अ रियली गुड क्वेश्चन दैट कैटिन खा कैटिन साहब she she yeah she says how many seconds should you pre think and and it's a really good question it's a question that i answered earlier but i think it's good that i answered it again um depends the answer depends on uh, at how um, how skilled a pre thinker you are in the first 10 arguments that you're going to do you probably will spend 90 seconds just to do pre thinking why because you're not as as skilled in it in the next 10 arguments you're going to probably do, spend about 60 seconds doing pre thinking Once you're done with 30 to 35 arguments, you got, that time is going to reduce to about 20 seconds, and eventually it's going to reduce to between 10 and 15 seconds. Um, so, 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 yeah. So that's it's it's a journey uh, 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 that you have to go through, and 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 you, you it, it it the the velocity with which you approach that 10 to 15 second mark depends on the intensity with which you you do pre thinking okay so that's something it's really important okay so this is a question that that uh, a lot of people do this why is it that people change their answers from b to to d i should have man i should have closed it but essentially when i when i ended the poll what was there was choice e was was uh, almost as popular as choice b um okay so let's kind of read this argument and typically so the the original accuracy on this is about 44% um, overall choice e is the correct answer uh, and we're going to really see why choice e is the correct answer and how pre thinking kind of narrows our focus it's very simple argument what's happening is we need to finance roads and because we need to finance roads the highway commission of a certain state is considering a 50% increase in toll and what is that toll amount right now it's a it's a 10 cent per mile toll for vehicles that are, which vehicles that are using its toll highway now the the beauty of this is that hey when you look at a numerical number something like this which is 10 cents per mile or something It's really important to read the units. You want to really know what is this value. It's for every mile you you know they're currently charging 10 cents, and they're going to increase that by about 50%. So it's going to get to uh, uh, 15 cents per mile. Then the highway commissioner makes a claim. He makes a prediction that the toll increase will increase. So the increase in toll will increase the annual revenue generated by the toll highway by at least 50% every year. So he's saying at a bare minimum we're going to get 50%. more revenue how to fit uh let me just clear all answers overall so we we look at this and we say hey let's first before we look at the answer choices let's do pre thinking and then and and then let's to do pre thinking let's understand the conclusion and the conclusion talks about this thing called annual revenue so how do you estimate annual revenue How do you estimate annual revenue? Okay. Okay, someone saying rate in terms of number of trips, distance time toll, that's good. Distance time toll price into sales divided by one again when you do this when i see a question annual revenue we are talking about in the context of this argument in the context of this argument the way you estimate annual revenue is the, the toll per mile multiplied by the total number of toll miles okay that's your annual revenue is everyone clear on this it's how much you're paying per mile and multiplied by the total number of miles which are traveled on on these highways okay now what do we already know what do we already know again we already know that the toll per mile 
is going to go up by 50%. We already know that the toll per mile is going to go up by 50%. Okay, that's given to us. So, if the toll per mile would go by 50%, let's ask our falsification question. Under what circumstances would the annual revenue not increase by 50%? Provided that the toll per mile, we are given that the toll per mile will be increased by 50%. So, under what circumstances will the annual revenue not increase by 50%? Given that the toll per mile will increase by 50%. If the total distance or total number of miles go down, that's the only scenario, right? The total miles go down, then, then, then that's the only scenario when you look at this over here. Okay, so the po only falsification scenario is that hey, if the total number of miles, if that number decreases, okay, so the assumption which is there is the total number of miles driven does not decrease. That's it. Is that clear? Just look at this once again. And then I'm going to look at every answer choice. Okay. So, let's look at answer choices. And, and let's look at choice B right now. Okay, a lot of people chose choice B. Choice B says, now, before I do this, let's kind of look at what is the definition of assumption? What is the definition of assumption? Can you type it down? <coughs> it's an unstated idea that must be true for the conclusion to hold true. Okay. Unstated idea that has to, that must be true for the conclusion to hold true. Now remember that definition. And now let's let's go and look at this answer choice. This answer choice says the total number of trips made on the toll highway will not decrease from its current level. Okay, what it's saying is hey, if in the past we made a thousand trips, now we're gonna make a thousand trips as well. And we have to evaluate is that a must be true? Okay. So, so the question that you ask is, hey, does this mean if the total number of trips decreases, let's say it goes down by 20%, does this mean that the total number of miles will, will necessarily decrease? Does it mean that? No, it doesn't really mean that the total number of miles traveled uh, will, 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 will decrease if the total, if the miles per trip increases, not decreases. Uh, Lucas, if the miles per trip increases in that case, uh, yes, not really. Why? Because it may still remain the same if the number of miles per trip increases. Okay. So then is that a must be true? Is this statement then a must be true? Is it required to be true? In other words, no, the answer is no, it's not a must be true, which means that this is not a correct answer choice. Okay. It's a good strengthener, by the way. If this were a strengthened question, this will be a good answer choice, but it's not an assumption. Okay. So, KP, option B is a strengthener regardless of whether option E is there or not. It is a strengthener, and it's not an assumption. Okay. Does that help, KP? And that's where assumption questions start to get tricky. In answer choices, you're going to see strengtheners and you're going to see this assumption. And, and you'll have to really say, hey, man, which one to pick? And which is where C versus E. Okay, C versus E is very similar. Just the same logic that you use to reject B. C really says C attacks the other part. A, B attacks the number of trips. C attacks the average length of the trip. If average length of the trip goes down, then how do we counter that? How do we counter the average length of the trip? We actually take more trips. Right? That's it. Both of them are strengtheners, not assumptions. What does choice E say? Choice E says the total distance, which is the number of miles, 
traveled by vehicles, not a single vehicle, but vehicles on the toll highway will not decrease. Okay. <coughs> so, which is why choice E is the correct answer. Now, if you think about it, no other answer choice even comes close when you think about the very specific definition of assumption. Choice E is not best among the answer choice. It is the choices. It is the only answer choice that fits the criteria of the definition of an assumption. It is the only answer choice. Right? It's the only answer. No other. I mean, choices B and C are wrong, regardless of whether choice E is there. And, and that's something that I want you to take away. We are not trying to choose the best among the given answer choices. And that's something which is true for every GMAT question, whether it's in, in, in CR, whether it's in SC or in RC. The correct answer would be 100% correct. The incorrect answer would be 100% incorrect. Uh, won't cost have an impact on revenue? Garima, which answer choice are we talking about here? Uh, that way I can address that. A, the total amount of money required for road repairs. Do we care about the amount of money required for road repairs for, um, for uh, when it comes to the conclusion? The conclusion isn't saying that it will connect enough money. The conclusion really saying that the um, annual revenue collected will be higher than what it was last year. And that's kind of where the context sometimes tries to, con to, to confuse you in order to, to finance road repairs. Yes, that's a context, but that's not what the, 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 the author is saying. Okay. Does that help, Garima? If you, if you're still confused, think of yourself as this highway commissioner and really say, hey, let's think of a scenario where where uh, you increase the revenue by 50% and, and then the, the re repair cost even goes up. Will you still blame the highway commissioner? No. Why? Because all he's saying is I'm going to increase the revenue by 50%. He is not claim making any claim about the repair costs. Okay. So let's now start to have more fun. We're going to go towards questions which are a bit more challenging, by the way. The next question that you're going to really see is, is probably one of the most challenging questions that you're going to see in critical reasoning period. So the way I go about doing this is <coughs> I ask you to select this answer choice which is not answered. That way I don't time you as a group. Uh, you, the, the, you as a group is, is, are timed by the wisdom of this group overall. So I want 60 people to choose not answered. And, and, and essentially what happens is when 80% of you choose another answer choice other than not answered, I call time. Sixty people to choose not answered. I have 26 people who've chosen not answered. 30 people. 37, 38. 42, let's get to 50, 50 people to choose not answered, 48, 49, 50.
all right guys get those answers in 70 percent of the class is done Okay, five, four, three, two, and one. Let's end the poll. Okay, choose an answer choice, guys. Want to broadcast the results? You can see the answer choices. Choice B. Uh, very very popular choice D very popular and choice A also quite popular okay um, is this question similar to the hypothesis question uh, in some ways you're going to find commonalities between every question Ronald and, and let me explain the question to you and then I think I'll, I'll let you be the judge of it so now we're going to do our next question so again you guys know the drill you've got to select not answered so I want you guys to select not answered and then I'm going to show the question to you and then you're going to go about solving the question. So uh, 50 people to select not answered, 48, 50, good. That's true, here is your
Okay, guys, 70% of you are done. Let's get those answers in. Five, four, three, two, and one. Um, pretty much everyone is done right now. I'm going to broadcast the results. <coughs> choice D, the most popular choice. Choices C and E are also very popular. Uh, very few people chose choice A or choices A or B. That's good. So we can close the 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 polls in the presenter area, and then we'll move forward. So two questions, two difficult questions, two 700 level questions. Really good participation. I'm really really proud of you guys uh, over here. So that's I want to commend you guys for 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 that willingness to learn that you've shown. So 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 pat yourself on the back. And let's start the analysis now and then figure out where we're faltering and how can we get better. So RDS technology, really difficult question. Lots of technical stuff in this particular question. And and, and, and this is what I call as a split theory in, in the classical context of when we see the answer choices over here. Okay. Um, so, so what's my conclusion over here? My conclusion is fairly simple. The conclusion is that the number of Verlanders who are receiving the special program information did not increase significantly in this time period. Now, here is something that I want you to, to actually observe while you're reading the conclusion. Okay, There are three things which are there in this conclusion. One is it talks about number of Verlanders. The second is it talks about special program information. And the third is it talks about this time period. Do you guys see each of these three points over here? Yes? Yes. Now, if the conclusion talks about this, then would you agree that the assumption should also be related to special program information? The conclusion is about special program information then the assumption is should also be related to special program information. Just purely from reading the conclusion. Agreed? And this is something which I'm just showing. And, 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 and this is where that focus truly helps. Um, now, let's look at this part over here. I want you to read choice D and I'm going to get to a proper reasoning. Okay. Who does choice, does choice D talk about special program information? Does choice D for Delta talk about special program information? Does it? No, it doesn't. But just, just to something you were confused with choice D uh, and, 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 and some of you were worried about it, had you just read the conclusion, you should have been able to really say, man, this doesn't seem to be a likely choice. But we'll, we're going to reject this with proper reasoning. Don't worry about it if, if you're not completely convinced. Okay. But this is the main conclusion. That's what the author wants to say. Then number three statement uh, says that, however, since the number of RDS equipped radios and in 96 and 98 were about the same. So essentially what it's saying is if you had a thousand radius radios in 96, you had a thousand in 94. That that these are radios that people have in there uh, with them on which they listen to to radio programs. Okay. Uh, between 94 and 96, the number of RDS stations increased from 250 to 600. Um, and so, so, so two things happen between 94 and 96. One is the number of receiving radios remain the same. This is on which you listen to programs. But the number of transmitting stations, they actually increased quite a bit. They actually more than doubled given this number over here. There's a significant increase. Okay. Now, now, do you see the word however over here? Why is, when you see two statements being connected by however, what do you infer from this? Two and three have a however in between them. 
What do you infer from that, however? There's a contrast, there's a contradiction. Yes, it's not a run on sentence. It, there's a contrast over here, which means these two seem to be going in opposite directions. You know, the number of transmitting stations are increasing, but the number of radios kind of remain the same. And, and this is something which is really important. Why? Because if you look at and, 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 and do a deep logical thinking, statement number two kind of goes against what the conclusion is saying. Okay. Another way to look at it is three seems to support the conclusion and two goes against three. So two probably goes against the conclusion as well. The enemy of my friend is most likely my enemy. Okay. Then statement one says radio stations with RDS technology broadcast special program information that only radios with an RDS feature can, can receive. There's a, one of the things which you, you must really focus on is, is when you see the word must, when you see the word only, they, they, they kind of talk about a special relationship. They talk about and, and statements that have all must only allow you to infer information that is, is not usually present otherwise. So radio stations with RDS technology broadcast special program information that only radios with RDS feature can receive. What it really means is that, hey, if you uh, if you, you need an RDS station and you need an RDS radio to get the special program information. If you don't have either, you will not get special program information. Everyone with me so far? Okay. Lots of technical stuff, lots of deep learning over here. So what's the logical structure? And once you do this as a logical structure, things become really simple. Between 94 and 96, very few conclusions say that very few additional Vs received RDS programs. Well, Landis is a bit wordy. Let's call them Vs. What happened between 94 and 96? Number of receiving radios, which is what people have, that remained almost unchanged. Number of transmitting stations, that increased quite a bit. The context is to receive RDS programming, you need RDS radios. Okay. So, based on this, the author arrives at his conclusion. Now, what's my falsification question? My falsification question would be, under what conditions will there be a significant addition? And again, significant addition to the number of people receiving RDS programming. Remember, the conclusion said very few additional. We want to break that conclusion, which means we're going to really say significant addition. Is that part clear to everyone? Forming this falsification question is the skill that you need to learn. Once you get that, life is very simple. Given that, there are very few additional radios. And given that, there are a lot more transmitting stations. Now, who can help me formulate falsification scenarios? Under what situation or scenario will there be a significant addition given these pieces of information? Can you tell me some scenarios? If more number of people, what? The number of radios cannot increase. There are very few additional radios. You can't go against the facts in the argument. If people share, that is great. Let's see who said people share. Uh, KP said people share. Oh, and, 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 and Deb also said of each radio, if more people listen to each radio okay the other is if there are unutilized radios that are utilized now and Sarvagya said that that's really good uh, Lucas also said a really good point which says if RDS radio owners did not have access to stations in 94 but now they do in 96 so both Lucas and who else it's Sri uh, who, who said it Sarvagya said the, the same thing which is hey if the additional stations now cover areas where there was no coverage area but people actually did have the right kind of radio so 
So hey, if you had a, a phone on which you could play a movie, but, but the networks weren't there, but now the networks are put in in 96 and you can play a movie on your phone. Or if people per radio goes up, if, if, if you start putting these radios in Starbucks, and, and, and essentially more people are listening to those radios, then, then also despite a similar number of radios, many more people start to receive RDS programming. Okay. Both falsification scenarios, everyone gets them. Under either of these scenarios, the conclusion will break down. Right? So, you guys got these scenarios. What are the assumptions? The assumptions are that new stations do not increase my coverage significantly, which means they shouldn't be put in areas where people had the right kind of radios but, but had no coverage earlier. The second is people per radio should remain about the same. They shouldn't increase, that number should not increase a whole lot. Those are my two assumptions. <coughs> Does that make sense? The two assumptions? Cool. Let's move forward. So, let's look at answer choices. Choice A is the correct answer, by the way. Um, a lot of you chose choice A in this case. Choice A says, and it's a very wordy answer choice. So, let's kind of simplify this. Choice A says, few if any of the RDS, few if any means almost none, of the RDS radio stations that began broadcasting after 94. Which are the RDS stations that began broadcasting after 94? These are the newly put stations. Okay. So almost none of the new radio stations broadcast to people with RDS equipped radios living in areas not previously reached. So if they're broadcasting to people with RDS increased equipped with the right kind of radio who were living in areas which were not previously reached, that's about increasing the coverage. Okay. Segment by segment. I've just put in, I've simplified it. So what the choice is saying is almost none of the re new radio stations increase the coverage of RDS programming. Can you see the simplification over here? All right. Okay, I have C, I, I have yes, I have Y, uh, and one essentially saying reach has not increased. Yes, that is correct, KP. Uh, so this is my correct answer choice. Negated statement would be at least some radio stations increase coverage. If some radio stations increase coverage, what happens to my conclusion? It breaks apart, which confirms that this is my correct answer choice. Okay. Um, so we have someone saying C. Uh, I, I was hoping to hear some German as well with Genau over there. So that's choice A is the correct answer. Okay. Uh, let's look at choice B, and and, and I'm going to bring back my poll to really see which all answer choices were uh, were popular. Choice A, but 18%. Choice B was 31%. Choice D was 22% or so. Now, before we go into choice P, once again, what's the definition of a uh, of an assumption? What's the definition of an assumption? An unstated idea that must be true for the conclusion to be valid. And then again, if you're irritated, that's good. Why? Because that's when you, it, it's in your blood. Okay, let's look at what choice B says. Choice B says, in 1996, okay, most were landers who lived within the listening area of, of an RDS station already had a radio equipped to receive RDS. Essentially, what this choice is saying is, if you lived within a covered area, if a majority of people who lived within a covered area had an RDS equipped radio. Now, answer this question. Is it required that most were landers who lived within the listening area had 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 uh, had had the right kind of radio for my conclusion to be true? Or in other words, if in 1994 only 20% of the were landers um, uh, had had an RDS equipped radio 
and then in 1996 also 20% of the world landers had an rds equipped radio would the conclusion not be true so the question is is this word most required and the answer to that is no it's not a must be true okay <coughs> and this is that that again that that strengthener trap you know if if that is true yes you know you believe in the conclusion more but 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 it's not a must be true if that number was were 20% in 94 and that number is 20% in 96 you're all fine okay choice c not many people chose this we don't care about this over here choice d was also very popular okay choice d says in 1996 and this is very interesting when you choose a chance of choice and you really say man this answer choice had so many reasons why i would want to reject this but still i selected you this is a classical indication that you got lost in the argument in 1996 were landers who did not own radios equipped to receive rds do we care about people who who don't have rds radios do we care about people who don't have the right kind of radio Do we care about those guys? No, we don't care about them. These guys could not receive any programming. Do we care about any programming in my conclusion? No, we don't. And nine, thank you. I say I hear German now. Uh, Danke schön. Uh, so, so why is it wrong? We don't care about people who don't have any radios. We don't care about any programming, uh, and and because of which this choice is wrong. I mean, it's wrong on many counts. the type of programming irrelevant to the number of people over here okay now what did you learn from this difficult question really difficult question okay but but you know when a question is difficult it also provides a lot of opportunities to learn what did you learn from this question context really important understanding the conclusions really important asking the pre thinking question distills the argument in your mind right and then when you read an answer choice make sure you understand what the answer choice is saying before really saying man is this the correct answer choice it has to be a two step process where i i saw the answer choice i did that choice explanation in my mind with before even evaluating and then i said why the hell is this answer choice correct or wrong falsification is not an art falsification is a skill and the reason i i want to make sure that that we make that distinction is because a skill can be learned with practice an art is something that is abstract it is not an art it is a skill because when you say something's an art you you actually start to think about it and you really say man i i, I it's something that i can't do because it's an art you break it down into step by step you get that skill so this is a very interesting question now shall be well okay so what's happening over here we collect refuse last year we did not send anything for 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 recycling or uh, we actually burned everything and and that incineration or burning created a lot of residual ash okay okay and 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 that's something that is that is wonderful you know you people don't like it you get you get a lot of residual ash now i couldn't get a really good icon for a truck i actually got an icon for a trash can so let's assume one trash can is equal to one truck full of 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 load which was sent for incineration so how many trash cans were sent last year uh, for incineration can you count the number of trucks 10 right 10 now this year if we collect the same amount of refuse based on the logic provided by the author how many how many trucks do you think they'll send for incineration 5 right okay now and this is where the beauty of this argument comes in i want to make sure that you guys have truly understood what the author is trying to say if instead of collecting the same amount of refuse if 
the if the the city collects 10 times as much refuse if instead of collecting the same amount of refuse if i collect 10x as much refuse how many trucks do you think i'm going to be sending for incineration this year if i collect 10x the, the refuse that i collected last year How many trucks will I be sending for incineration? All right, let's get a few more responses. The question is, if I collect 10x the, 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 the amount of refuse, how many trucks will I be sending for incineration this year? Three, two, and one let me end the poll and broadcast the results 39 percent of you say five you guys are absolutely correct 32 percent of you say 50 you guys are wrong 17 percent of you say 100 you guys are wrong as well and this is kind of where the beauty of this argument is the correct answer is five why let's kind of read this last statement this year, city services will separate for recycling enough refuse to reduce, to is a purpose word, to reduce the number of truckloads to be incinerated to half of last year's number. So what is the author saying? The author is saying that regardless of the amount of refuse that we collect this year, I'm only going to send half as many truckloads for incineration as I sent last year. So even if you collect a hundred truckloads worth of refuse. I'm only going to send how many truckloads worth for incineration? Five. Five. Not 50. Half of what it was last year. And how many did I send last year? Ten. Okay. It is always half of last year's number. And that's the, 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 the beauty that you need to recognize in the language. If, if I'm only going to send half as many truckloads, if I'm only going to send half as many truckloads, then what's the only condition that needs to be true? Here's a logical structure. You guys can see this. Last year, all refuse burst was burned. This year, and that generated a lot of ash. This year, we're going to send half as many trucks for incineration. And, and the conclusion that we want to really prove is that the ash generated this year would be half of what it was last year. So my falsification question, under what circumstances will the ash generated be greater than 50%? Remember, we are trying to falsify the conclusion even if I'm only sending half as many truckloads uh, for incineration. Okay, possible scenario, the average ash generated per truckload is 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 higher higher than what it was last year that would falsify my conclusion this would break my conclusion down so if this breaks my conclusion down my assumption is that the ash per truck load is going to be similar to or lower than what it was last year okay now vishnu says the recyclable content should be present do we care about that do we care about it and this is kind of where the focus on conclusion is really important do we care about recyclable con content in the in this grand scheme? No. Why? Because what generates ash? What generates ash here? What generates ash? No, a truck doesn't generate ash. Incineration generates ash. Right? Incineration, burning something generates ash. Okay, it's not what is not recycled. It is what's burned, that's, that is what generates ash. Again, this is where you guys are getting confused. What generates ash? Incineration. Anything that's burned, that's in, if you put stuff in landfill, it doesn't generate ash. It may not be recyclable. I don't care. As long as you're not burning it, you're not going to generate ash. Okay. And what is incinerated? Those truck loads, not trucks, but the truck loads of, 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 of refuse is incinerated as per the argument. So do we care about recyclable stuff if we know we are only going to get half as many truckloads? 
No, we don't care about recyclable stuff. Why? Because what is burned is what's sent to me. And I know, given the information and the argument, that I'm going to get half as many truckloads. And that's where you've got to understand the beauty of the argument. It's very easy when you see this question on a forum and you really say, man, choice D is the correct answer and you choose it and, and you move forward and you really say, okay, I did it right. But if you don't understand the depth behind it, you're going to get a similar question and you're going to make a mistake on it. And that's what you want to avoid. This is, a, is what I call as a very low risk scenario. It's a low risk but high understanding scenario. When you get to the exam, it's going to be a high risk scenario. You don't want to make a mistake then. And Vishnu, you won't get more trucks than five because the, the author is telling you we are only going to send half as many truckloads. That's a factual part of the argument. You, you made a mistake in reading the, the argument, not conclusion, in, in reading the, the factual part of the argument. Yes. And that's important to understand. Where did you make a mistake? Because once you understand that, you're not going to repeat it. And if you don't repeat it, you get the question right. Okay. Choice A. Let's kind of see how you guys polled over here. You know, choices C, D, and E were popular. We're going to focus on those. No materials that city services could separate for recycling be incinerated. This is, you know, not a popular choice, but this is one of the only answer choices which, in which case, why is this answer choice wrong? Can anyone tell me? Why is this in incorrect? Why is this incorrect? You know the three questions. Yes. Who get who got that? Deb, thank you very much. It can be inferred. The factual part of the argument says that it's it, it, that this part over here. There is no new information here. If this weren't inferred, then this could be a, a correct assumption. Okay. Choice B talks about cost. We don't worry about cost in the argue in, in the conclusion. The conclusion is about the amount of residue lash. Okay. And and good job, guys, if for, for identifying that this has no new information. Okay. And and good job, Bhagwat. Choice C, popular choice, talks about the proportion of recyclable material than what it was last year. It compares that. The larger word is a comparable word. We don't care about it for two reasons. One. I'm only going to get half as many truckloads for incineration, and and <coughs> excuse me, and 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 two, the 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 piece which is there is we don't know what was the proportion last year, so it doesn't tell us anything about it. Maybe the proportion last year was 80%, maybe it was 20%. Why the hell do I care if I'm only going to get half as many truckloads for incineration, and only incineration produces residue ash? Choice D is in line with our thinking. It talks about the ash per truckload and it's the correct answer choice. And, and if you negate this, if you say ash refuse incinerated per truckload will generate more ash, then what happens to my conclusion? It breaks down. Why? Because even with half as many truckloads, you're going to generate a lot more residual ash. Okay, choice E says, the total quantity of refuse. We already kind of discussed that scenario. That total quantity of refuse has zero impact. Why? Because again, I'm going to, be, going to send half as many truckloads for incineration. So, what did we learn from this? What did we learn from this argument? Half of you got it wrong, half of you got it right. Think about it. Why did you make a mistake? Those of you who made a mistake. Those of you who got it right, did you read it properly? Did you understand it? Okay. Read properly. Concentrate on words. When statements start to overwhelm you, slow down. Why? Because you want to concentrate on words. Okay. Can we go over the correct option again? Absolutely. The refuse incinerated this year will generate no more residual ash per truckload. So ash per truckload in then 
incinerated than did the refuse incinerated last year. So it's comparing how much ash per truckload was generated last year. And it's saying this year it's going to be no more. It means it could be the same or it could be less. Okay. Does that help Srinivas? And, and I love that comment who said, you can't move on if you don't fully understand the argument. Uh, uh, okay. Time taken in getting better understanding is worth in the end. And, and again, <coughs> Lucas says, I thought that the amount of recyclable material had to be halved and not the incinerated part. And that's where Lucas, reading slowly, visualizing that argument, it's a key skill. And you've got to get that. Okay. Okay. And Srinivas, it doesn't say it's 50% less. Why? Because the argument says you're going to say get half as many truckloads. If you compare this argument with the highway miles argument, the logic is actually very similar. It had 50% there, this had 50% here. The correct answer is also kind of similar, but the wording is very, very different. Okay. So, how do you become a CR champ? The first thing you've got to really believe in is, is that pre-thinking is very doable. It's not rocket science. Contrary to what you're going to hear anywhere, pre-thinking uh, uh, is, is, is fairly simple if you follow the process. Okay, And if you achieve, use pre-thinking, you can achieve accuracy. You can do this efficiently. If you want to get the most out of this, the first thing is take the PDF, read it, read, go through the questions again. Once you've done that, Make sure you, you get the right foundation. Make sure you go through uh, the three lessons, introduction to assumption, pre-thinking logical gap, and pre-thinking two entities. Once you do that, do the practice. You will rarely see a difference in how you approach this. Don't time yourself doing this. Okay. If you're already an EG math student, make sure you go through the foundation module. Make sure you go through the inference module, then assumption, then evaluate, then strengthen, and so on and so forth. Now, why do, you, why do we want you to go through this? Why? Because as you go through the inference module, it's actually a fairly long module, but you would know when you read a statement, what can you infer from it? You would understand exactly how to visualize when you read a sentence, and then you'd really see that happen over there. Okay. All the mistakes that you're making, if you do that properly, you're not going to make that mistakes. Now, in each of these core modules, you will get feedback multiple times. So, whenever you do a concept file, it has evaluation in the end. It tells you how well you've done it. Whenever you do an application file, you do that. Whenever you do a practice quiz, you do this. You get that feedback. And the beauty of this is, if you get 80% or higher on those quizzes, you can be very certain you're moving towards that 90th percentile ability. Uh, in the entire CR module, you're going to get about... Uh, 90 in personalized feedback points is more feedback than what a private tutor would give you. Okay. Overall, uh, you're going to practice more than 500 full length questions in critical reasoning. These are EGMAT questions. Okay. These are not official questions. If you add the official questions on top of it, it's close to a thousand. You will not run out of questions. Actually, you probably need half as many questions. And, 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 and so what makes us so powerful? It's the integrated learning environment where you're not just learning the concepts and, and, and really saying, I'm going to learn strength and weak and assumption, evaluate, and then I'm going to worry about learning how to solve questions. You're learning those concepts. You're learning how to apply those concepts right then and there. And then you, as you're learning concepts, you're getting feedback. As you're learning application, you're getting feedback. And you, you have definitive qualifying exercises. Okay. Um, you learn application. And this application part is reinforced close to 15 times during the learning part. Okay. If you're a paid student, this is the paid part, just the assumption module. Okay. So it's just the assumption module over here. And and then each one of these entities, or we call them activities over here, each one of these has built an evaluation. Once you finish them, you're gonna see your scores over here, you're gonna see the actual time over here. Okay. So Essentially, you learn the concept, 
level one application, level two application, evaluation over here, and and and, and you graduate, you can really see that you've graduated well. So how do students get to that 100 plus point improvement? Okay, they solve every question using pre-thinking. That's really, really important. They learn the process. So learning the process means not timing yourself because when you time yourself, you don't read the argument properly. You miss segments. When you miss segments, you don't understand. And again, then you go back and forth between answer choices. You don't want to do that. Don't time yourself in the first half of the course. Do the OG questions as prescribed. Okay, why? Because it will give you that confidence. And ensure that in the concept quizzes and application quizzes and practice quizzes, get more than 80%. In the event you don't, revise the relevant portions, do those questions again. It may seem redundant, but trust me, you will save a ton of time. Okay. Do pre-thinking before you start looking at options. One last piece. You know, we spend a ton of time creating solutions for you. Review those detailed solutions and cross-check your approach with the correct approach. Okay. You will learn so much when you do this differential diagnosis. That, that you know, in 10 questions, you're going to find that you've improved a whole lot more than what you would when you work with a private tutor. Just to really tell you how comprehensive this is, when you compare this to some of the other resources, you're going to find it's, it's you know, close to uh, 7 to 8x as comprehensive. Uh, with that, I'm going to end this webinar. I want to thank you guys for being there. Here's another example of motivation for you to really say how quickly this can happen. Kind of, uh, Anupriya is, is one of her former students. She got a V46 on her verbal, uh, 99th percentile that is. But, but she actually was stuck at V32 for a fairly long time. But then once she decided, hey, I'm, she's going to approach this methodically, she's not going to worry about timing. She's going to focus on revising her mistakes and making sure that she doesn't repeat. She was able to do this, that V32 to V46 journey in about 20 days. Uh, she actually graduated from ISB last year. Um, but she was admitted to ISP within 10 days of applying. Again, just the power of focus and the power of data, you can really go from a 30th to a 90th percentile in about 10 days. And when you say 10 days, it's two hours per day during the working day and about four hours per day during the weekend of studying. That's it. Okay, with that, good luck. And uh, and, and, and thank you for, for being a part of this webinar. It'd be great if you could give me some feedback uh, on the webinar over here uh, in the short answer pod. And while you do that, I'm going to get you the session handout. And again, start with revising the presentation. Okay. All right, guys, with that, thank you very much and happy learning. Or, as we say in German, Danke schön und guten Tag. And auf Wiedersehen. Uh, shukriya in, in Hindi, yes.